Beardy and the Beast Media Club. This is placeholder intro song. Thank you for joining us for Beardy and the Beast Media Club, a full spoiler discussion into a piece of media. We'll not reveal all those spoilers and show no remorse for it at the end. If you enjoy what we do, please share us with your friends or join the discussion in the comments or at our Discord. My name is Drew, and always, we have our lovable idiot, Devin. I gotta be like that. <laughs> Today we'll be discussing the 2022 <laughs> Japanese animated action adventure, Bubble. So, Devin, was the bubble bountifully buoyant, or did the bubble burst so bitterly? I mean, good work with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear you struggling with it. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Not in post. <laughs> I I enjoyed it. I think the story was different than what I expected from the trailer. But overall, yeah, it, it was a it was a fun film. I enjoyed. It. What about you? Uh, I mean, fun. There's only two things that I could give it, and that would be fun and pretty. Yeah, but. I, I, the rest is kind of a mess. <laughs> um, I do kind of want a video game based off of that world. Like Mirror's Edge, but over the water. Yeah. Mirror's Edge with some of that shit. <laughs> I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> there did seem, however fantastical, there did seem to be a natural progression of... Like, they revealed everything, like, right out the gate. And there seemed to be... From a world building uh, standpoint, there seemed to be a natural progression going from Tokyo is in this state of disrepair to like all the orphan boys came here to um, creating a sport betting like needed resources um, to survive. Mm -hmm. And like there being this weird like sports community based run like the the battle cooler or whatever it was called that actually made a lot of sense to me from a uh like a fantastical world standpoint yeah i agree um like the 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 concept around the battle core i mean it looked cool mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean you gonna fight for your resources somehow why not make it something entertaining like this um especially when like gravity's all weird it's like yeah no that seems parkour makes perfect sense it was very hardcore there were some world building questions i kind of had around it though mm. it's like so there, there's some, a bit of inconsistency because they made it sound like they were cut off from the outside world but Makoto was like saying, yep, we were getting some supplies from this mysterious headquarters. So they weren't quite cut off, which Amy kind of goes like, so why are they needing the resources? Mm, okay, so I think each crew has their own way of getting resources. Um, I think the resources the Blue Blazers had um were because of the scientist who was held up with them so i think that was a form of payment i guess you could say okay. um is how i took it um the morticians were getting like shady sponsors from outside and then from that point you just have to assume the other two groups that they revealed i think it was uh have their own way yeah um and they also there was some scavenging there was a scene where um, the leader, not Kai, was it Kai? Um, I have the wrong screen up. I think that was his name. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Kai. Um, was scuba diving and like picking up stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, obviously, it's the entire city of. Tokyo and we have well not the entire greater city but it seems like um a large portion of it and 
maybe 50 people. Yeah. So, I mean, lots of scavenging. Well, I I guess that's where my little bit of confusion came from. It's like the, the mention of the HQ was one thing, but the mention of the HQ sending them resources kind of took away from the scavenging because, of course... I immediately took it as going to be a scavenging thing and Mm -hmm. they happen to have it. So let's put what we found up. Um, So just having it mentioned a couple places where people were getting outside help, it's kind of like, yeah, doesn't sound like this is as isolated as you're trying to make it out to seem. No, not at all. I agree with that. Um, The specifically the HQ thing. I also had like a fleeting moment before I just hopped back into the story. A Mm -hmm. consideration was like, are all these kids being sent resources simply because even though they shouldn't be in there and they've been told not to go, like, obviously they still need to eat and stuff. Yeah. So that was a consideration I had, but they didn't explore it. Honestly, it needed like two throwaway lines to kind of like solidify that entire concept. Yeah. It either needed two or three lines or just cut those two or three lines. Either way would have been a little more satisfying. I think. Yeah. I think, Um, or yeah, just a change Spe- specifically towards like payment for hosting the scientist. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I can't remember the context of the headquarter line, but I remember it not bothering me, but I may have been in a different headspace. So I'm just going to take it as the context that you're expressing, mm. which is like wonky, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. The big thing with the headquarter line is kind of like, okay, well, that that could make Makoto possibly a bit nefarious or something. Mm-hmm. She seemed to not really let anyone else know about it. So, yeah. I don't know. I think, think good for that. Um, I mean, most of this film is just a pile of stuff, so I wouldn't focus too much on... Like that particular point, it is probably the biggest fail- failure when it comes to the world building. Because however fantastical it was, at least that was cohesive in this film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think I don't know why. Whatever you just said, like I heard it and then just lost it. Um. Well, Sorry. then I'll no. Then I'll <laughs> then I'll expand upon it. Uh, if, I look at this film as are, are are you familiar with the uh concept of a treasure chest when it comes to uh like tattoos? Uh, yeah. So it's just like a bunch of random um pieces like not like a cohesive sleeve done by one artist but like just a bunch of tattoos over the say the arm yeah. in this case. That's kind of what I felt about Bubble. Mm. And in some places, it even felt like anime, but like as if constructed by the same people who do the new Marvel movies. Mm. All right. So, with the construction of the film, like the way the plot and everything had gone, because I, I see what you mean, where it's kind of like a, like, you know, it's a stewing pot. Mm hmm. Um, this is a film that immediately went to my mind, much like Alita did for you. It's like, this would have been a bit better served as a series mm. just to explore those points. Cause like the individual points, I think were fine. Um, I think the, just the way it was spread out is a little bit off. Whereas if they had it as a, a series, they could have explored a little bit more. So with that, it's like, I didn't mind the ro- the the Little Mermaid plot, which I was not expecting based off the trailer. <laughs> um, with Uta and um, Hibiki. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that worked perfectly fine. Um, I think the battle core stuff worked perfectly fine. But the things that would have been interesting, we didn't get to explore because of the, the film that would have added to the world building, like the, um, the Reaper guys. I can't remember what their actual section was called now. The morticians. The guys, yeah. Yeah. The guys with the masks, um, like 
because they set them up as antagonistic more than just, you know, another top team. Mm -hmm. It never explored anywhere. And, you know, they just ended up helping. Yeah. And that, that would have been a fun episode. Yeah. Or like OAV. Uh, It's, it just seemed. So to kind of expand, to clarify what I'm saying, uh, because I do agree. I do. You, you definitely pinned it well that this would probably be much better done as a series. Um, Of course I say that about a lot of things. (laughs) Um, But it seemed to me that they, they just took a collection of like characters and content concepts and then just threw them in the bowl and saw what came out. So like, okay, how about this little mermaid romance? We'll throw that in there. And then like, how about every uh, like major anime character trope from the last 20 years? Let's throw those in there. And it's like, okay, but like this cool sport where they do all this like ninja acrobatics. Okay. We're going to throw that in here. Um, And that's where I get that treasure chest feeling. Yeah, because it each part independently made a lot of sense to me, mm-hmm. but together it didn't it didn't meld well in my head. Um, so I like generally I'm not gonna well probably talk about them later, but the Hibiki and Uda thing, like yeah. their story, I actually like that. Mm-hmm. It was fun, like um, will they, won't they, etc. Like the scientist and the monitoring of the like the event and things are coming back to catastrophe and stuff. Like that's a plot on its own, you know. Like yeah. there's like six tornado movies in the late nineties that revolve around scientist lady and <laughs> um tornadoes. <laughs> um <laughs> So the the ba- <laughs> <laughs> the the battle the battle core entire sport and grouping mm-hmm. that made really sense and that was very fun but in the end and I mean I'm I'm purely stating an opinion here something very subjective but the importance of battle core to the film was either pure like in in context to the entire film served two purposes and that was one to be very showy and very attractive on the eyes like something very actiony and two to explain why hibiki can do crazy martial arts parkour jumping back and forth in the final battle mm. i almost get the feeling that i i think the the story that they wanted to tell mm-hmm. um, was straight up just the the Little Mermaid remake. Mm-hmm. Definitely, but they wanted to, tar- but they wanted to target the <clears throat> um, the young male audience instead. So they moved it to the actiony bit, and and that's where that is thrown in, which I think is why both pieces work very well. Just feels a little bit out of place with how they put them together. I like the way you put that. I li- I really like the way you put that. I think one thing that I was missing, and it was probably because there was such a random focus on other things, the vortexes, the life spirals and that sort of thing, they kept referencing it, but it, it didn't feel like an afterthought. It didn't feel like they were trying to tie things together, but it certainly... I don't think it fit as well as they tried to, like it should have. I agree completely. That that was kind of one of the things that stuck out in my mind. It's like, it's that I can see what you're trying to do, Mm -hmm. but you're leaving it too open. It's like, give it a little bit more explanation. I mean, you've got something tied with, Uta and, and the bubbles and such, like, how do these spirals go in? How do they actually connect? Um, <clears throat> the other big thing with the spirals I was thinking is, like, aliens? Because there was so much space imagery mm-hmm. around these talks of the spirals and such. And it, it almost felt like they were using the wrong word. 
Mm. Because, like, I think they want it spirals because of the imagery of the shells and, mm. and, and it, it's natural. But they were explaining cycles, not spirals. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just kind, of just kind of like that. It's that slight miss again. It's like, I can see what you're doing. Yeah, just another piece thrown into that bowl, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're coming out with trail mix, not a not a cake or a cookie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, both are good. <laughs> both are good, but um, like, there's reasons why you don't put, you know, uh, dry roasted garlic in your trail mix. That that is very true. <laughs> <laughs> It took me a moment there to figure out like something that wouldn't go in. I'm like, but like salty stuff is good in trail mix, like a little savory. Oh, that uh, wasn't slivered almonds. <laughs> what are you we're talking about? Trail mix. <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely talking about trail mix. What are you talking about? There, there was no problem in the the recording of this episode. None whatsoever. <laughs> Them trying to introduce the concept of cycles by spirals to give the natural and vortex imagery, especially when it comes to, like, say, the funneling out of liquid. Like, I see what they were going on with there, but I feel like they missed the mark. Yeah, it's one of those things, again, where it's like, either you need to be a little tighter in how you're explaining it, or just have the imagery without explaining it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, and then, like the big, the big thing that they didn't go into was probably like most important thing to me, and I thought it was going to end up being like, uh, like a big thing at the end that they kind of caused the incident, mm -hmm. and like a bunch of people died, and I was like, how's this going to reflect? How's this going to create controversy? Oh. I called a bunch of that shit like early on in the film. I'm like, oh, Uda's the reason for this. I, I, I just knew mm. and in a way she was. It was like her shadow self, basically, that that caused it. Um, at what point in the anime did you think that they were dead? I didn't actually think they were dead. Oh, well, yeah, interesting. Totally Not entered my mind, like a, like an angel beats type thing, where it's like, oh no, they're they're actually <laughs> going to cross over. <laughs> what's, what's really going to blow your mind thinking about is, do you think that Hibiki is going to confess the incident to Shin, the older man? Mm. And the reason why I say that is because standing on that observation deck right next to Hibiki is Shin's wife and daughter. Oh, crap. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember thinking, it's like, huh, I wonder why they're showing that photo. And it just completely left my head that they showed that photo. <laughs> well, I was wondering if you would question the motivation of why Shin would try to get to up the tower so much. Mm. It's yeah, no. I, like, you say that, this makes perfect sense and it was completely lost on me <laughs> uh <laughs> but uh anyways like weird it was just like weird you know what i think i nailed it down all right they should have removed the little mermaid stuff just all together made a different movie with it maybe targeting like a different demographic like not trying to nail like the the male views or viewers or whatever mm. um so they could have focused more directly on that storyline mm, yeah and then focused on the things that they seem to sideline in this that took a back seat and then made things feel more jumbled or less cohesive yeah um the reason why i say it that way is because i want to see that adaptation of my little or uh, my little mermaid <laughs> the little the mermaid, mermaid but i don't think this is the right stage for it yeah um because I, I know when i go into that bit like 
And I wonder if it's something to do with like the creators as well. Cause they, so like the, the writer on this is the same writer who did Modica and fate or did some of fate did some of, um, uh, psychopaths, like all of these anime that are already kind of that bit odd and genre bending a bit. Mm hmm. And, you know, things like Modica definitely could use a couple of viewings because there's a lot going on. Mm. Um, so I, I wonder how much of that is there? How much is, you know, would a repeat viewing help with some of it as well and clear up the jumble a little bit? Maybe. I just like, it gets that odd feeling like... um I'm probably focusing on it too much, but the jumble makes it feel a little bit like story by committee, but I'm not talking to the like sequel trilogy levels, mm. but like maybe it's just too many hands in the pot. You know what? I don't necessarily think it was too many hands in the pot. Mm. Um, no, I, I think what it is, is again, it goes back to, they wanted the little mermaid story mm. and they did it well. And they wanted to do it in this unique world. So, so again, that, that idea of moving this into a series, you'd be able to keep both elements. Well, exactly. Because they, because they had such a, because it's such a cool world concept and, you know, kind of tying that to the, to the romance storyline. Like it didn't bother me. Just, we didn't get enough room to breathe with the battle core mm. and the, politics and, and such around that well that's what i was honestly mostly interested with uh <laughs> because the like again they did the my little uh mermaid or my little mermaid <laughs> the little someone's mermaid got ponies on, someone's got ponies on the brain <laughs> no just say or slivered almonds <laughs> um <laughs> but uh yeah, this this would have made the a perfect series. Yeah. Um and then we we had so many like unique uh unique's not the right term. Characters that were different from each other. I can't call them unique characters because they all have a do a dozen different versions of themselves across every other anime. Um they're, they're unique in the story. Like none of yeah. the characters felt the same. Unique um, works. <laughs> yeah, it's I, I don't want to ascribe a broad uh, meaning of unique to it. Hmm. Um, but seeing how they interact, like maybe having the betrayal episode, having like the contest episodes, like putting the group at risk because like maybe Habiki runs off and then like Uta goes to like bring him back. It's, things like yeah. that. Like s showing the interactions with these characters and developing relationships um, between them mm -hmm. would be what I would be interested in seeing. Yeah. Um, and the, the relationships of the groups and then like, heck you could have, you know, like the military come in and try to like um, force all the kids away, but then there's like a small catastrophe with the bubbles and the kids save them. And then, you know, they do that thing that doesn't make sense in the real world where it's like, well, you saved us, so we're grateful. So, like, here's some supplies, and we won't bring you back. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, maybe it is just too much for one movie. Yeah. Especially like, was this hour forty? Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's on the shorter side of some of the stuff we've watched. <laughs> I don't think adding time would have fixed that either. No. It, uh, it's really one of those things that needed the format of an episode with like an overarching mm -hmm. story, you know, much like we're going through kind of with Firefly, right? That, that type of story, episodal where we can explore, okay, what are the undertakers? What is up with Makoto? You know, is there that betrayal? And mm -hmm. then have the mystery of the bubbles slash little mermaid story as the overarching um, tying piece. Well, and then you can like 
match up the spirals versus cycles and then just creating a uh, repeating pattern of that throughout the film the series and then the end comes around to the beginning which they kind of did the, this here but yeah. yeah yeah another thing i didn't like lol <laughs> there's a bunch <laughs> Which is like I enjoyed the movie. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wouldn't put this on my recommend list if I had like a top ten. Um, even if I were to say top ten Japanese animated action adventure <laughs> movies. <laughs> so Hibiki's big thing was like sensitivity to sound. Yes, which was magically cured while running in the very middle of the film. Like characters. I know this is probably like feeding into like a, a standardized progression of the way these happen, but these type of flaws are usually gotten rid of as a show of gaining strength or maturity just before the climax. Mm -hmm. The fact that it was like, it should have been a bigger thing. So I, I agree. I think there's a couple ways we can choose to interpret it. Um, I think it was one way is it's showing his character growth. He's not shutting out the world anymore. Mm -hmm. I think the big thing is it wasn't necessarily meant to be not directly Hibiki's character growth but more to show the impact that Uta is having on him. If that makes sense. Uh, it does, but it's also not a concept that was explored well enough. Yeah. Not that it has to be explained, but it just wasn't explored well enough. So um, yeah. the original reason why he was able to take off his auditory sen sensitivity uh, headphones in the original was because of the song. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, in hindsight, I guess kind of comes in together because of the whole, like, trying to uh, tie in Little little Mermaid. Yeah. But I don't even know if that was necessary. I think that's the bigger thing, again, was like, was it necessary? Like, I immediately picked up on the fact that he was noise sensitive even before they explained it. Um. Yeah, he wasn't like, just uh, wasn't just like the emo like shy guy. Yeah, I mean he kind of was. <laughs> <clears throat> he was, but not because you know he, he was feeling emo that day. I, I think he was because of the circumstances of literally having to shut out the world, <laughs> mm -hmm. as opposed to you know everything's being so dark, just like my soul. <laughs> um it was go ahead and is is this not a not a thing that the other characters would have known about him they, and they commented on it. why didn't they make a big deal of it so i think they tried to, i think they tried to but again the the fact that this was a movie as opposed to a series or a few OVAs, um, it didn't get the focus it needed to because it wasn't the core part of the story. Mm. Um, but no, when he was there celebrating with them, like a few of them said, it's like, oh crap, are we being too loud for you? So it was noticed by them. I, I honestly took that as just consideration of the people that was there. Not an acknowledgement that he's gone gotten over some personal issue but literally just like uh oh crap we're being inconsiderate i i is how i took that moment it it, it was an acknowledgement of them knowing that that's not why he is that's why he's locking himself away is the part that i took from it okay um, so, so they were being considerate because they know he's noise sensitive because why else would they specifically go and say, oh, are we being too loud for you? Especially when they're likely acting like they normally do. It's just odd that he was there. Mm. Yeah, we just saw that slightly differently. Yeah. 
I did. I wasn't really keen on Uta. What I did like about there was two things that I liked about her. All right. Um. The the fact that, like, I actually liked that she would, you know, read parts of the story of the Little Mermaid as like the events were being mirrored in real time in the film. Mm-hmm. That had that had a very like bedtime story kind of fairy tale um feeling to it and i yeah. i like that that kept reoccurring it might not be for everyone and the other thing that i like even though she was super good at everything and learned complex math in a day and can do all the special tricks first time and all that she actually has a weakness mm. and it's literally like if even though Hibiki's trying to or dying to try and he wants to kiss the girl uh, if he does she'll literally turn into bubbles yeah <laughs> um, so it's not like she's invincible like it shows some weakness to her mm-hmm. and that's missing in a lot of things it's like why Captain Marvel was not that really really that interesting because it's like she was never in danger in the first place ever <laughs> <laughs> we're in we're in as this like literally physical contact with con uh contact with the character that she she adores that she loves that she's trying to be part of the world for <laughs> yeah um which without the little mermaid's uh story to it this would be a very forced relationship but thankfully, the Little Mermaid saves it. Um, yeah, she can't even hold his hand. Yeah. Can't even give him a high five. Yeah. Um, it was just, I, w- I would have liked to see that explored a little bit more if it was a series. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, um, having that weakness to such an OP character is nice. Yes. Um, es- especially because it's also like, not necessarily a flaw in her character, just a flaw in her existence. Yeah. The, that, that openness of her character just made me like, it didn't take me out of the film being here like that. It just made me again, questions like, okay, what are the bubbles? Like, mm. is this an alien or something? I mean, she's clearly observant. So, and you know, okay. Yeah. She knows how to use the bubbles and parkour around because you know, she's one of them. Um, so, that stuff made sense. It just made me more question. It's again, things that I would love to see explored in a series, or I'm not sure if there's a manga based off of this or something that this is based off of. Mm. Right. Like that's the type of stuff that I want to, <laughs> well, that's the thing I want to get from. They contained it almost immediately mm-hmm. when she, when she touched him and her hand like got a bunch of bubbles on it. Yeah. Um, they put a limit onto it so that, she was she wasn't like god level or post god level yeah um there was something anchored and more real to it because there was something constrained about her existence in the film yeah which because of that limit makes it a bit more intriguing because mm-hmm. it, it also makes you go like she touched a bunch of other people yes why wasn't she turning to bubbles with them Mm-hmm. I, I was going to bring up that same thing. It's like, okay, so what, what is that aspect? I think, again, this is one of those things that was like, I think I was kind of picking up on what they were trying to do with some of these things. Just didn't get to, it didn't quite explore as the way it did. Cause I realized there was a connection between these two fairly early on. Mm. And I kind of suspect it's like, I think, like it just entered my mind that she was the reason for the, the catastrophe Mm -hmm. essentially like picked up on that before. Yeah. I said fairly early on, probably about eh, third of the way through the film. It just made sense to me as soon as kind of the little mermaid and such was introduced. I'm like, okay, I can see how these things are paralleling. Mm -hmm. Um, so I almost expected like, as she was, touching them and turning into bubbles that that 
would have been a larger cause for everything catastrophizing as well. But or the second bubble fall <laughs> happening. Uh, but they again they I think that's what they were going for, but didn't quite explain it right. I'm not sure if I'm projecting here or not. Uh not so much for me to call you on it. Um, um, <laughs> I I saw the turning into bubbles as an ice limiter, um, also unique. Yeah, but I also saw it as an adequate replacement for um, not being able to talk mm. to the prince. Because honestly, I've had enough of that kind of yeah story. Like that yeah. was that was already told multiple times. The Little Mermaid. It was great. Yeah. Um. Uh. So much so that you know, Yay Tall Drew wouldn't even leave the theater when it was mm. in theater. I think he threw a tantrum or some such, or cried. I was really young. I think we've talked about this before. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that unique spin. Mm-hmm was nice in context. And this is why I think that they handled the translation of little, the, the little mermaid quite well. Yeah. Not, not bell levels. Yeah. But the way they handled the little mermaid stuff was miles beyond what they handled elsewise in the film. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, let, let's jump to the little mermaid aspect here now. Um, I think we've kind of gone through the other parts that Yeah, well I, you're you're like yeah. a little mermaid pro, so Yeah. So I, I kind of it was interesting because I could see that they kind of took the Hans Christian Anderson and that's what they were basing it more off of. Mm. But there's still like little aspects of the Disney version there. Mm-hmm. Um so one of the biggest differences um between the two that most people don't know is um in the Hans Christian Andersen version, the prince does not care about really the mermaid. Yes, so it it, it actually ends up becoming a very unrequented love, and so so bits of the story that were there is um like it kind of got mentioned where it's like it was painful for the mermaid to be on land, but she was just so enamored with the prince mm. that she went through it, and. Basically, it's like uh, the Disney version where it ends, where he's about to marry Ursula. That's essentially that's essentially there, but he has another lover, and the the mermaid is more of like a mistress type thing. Mm. And the only way that she can return is by is by killing the prince. Okay, which she doesn't do. She kills herself and becomes sea foam. I see. Because so it's like this weird blending, like, or rather toning down the uh, HCA version. Yeah. I mean, like, I know you've expressed, or it might have been a different video I was watching, expressed problems <laughs> with the Disney version, how no matter, like, it's a decent film, but it's, it seems to be more about the king than it does, seems to be yeah. about Ariel, stuff like that. Yeah, I think Which, we talked about it in Bell, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I still, like, I saw enough of the parallels, and it, it didn't yeah. throw me off, because I'm not familiar with the HCA stuff um, at all. I just assumed that it was a more of a, uh, how, how, how do they do it? They do this a lot in anime, but they'll take, like, another story, uh, they'll boil it down to a few cute parts and then they'll kind of like switch things about and then they'll base like that's how they kind of do the conversion yeah i know we've talked about that obviously in bell there's a couple others you know we've definitely talked about that with um like i liked the way they converted this i I think they they converted it more true to the original than disney version did Mm -hmm. um it, it was it was an interesting way, like as you said, just to build on the the fact that they established that he can't touch him. Mm-hmm. Uh, was a really interesting way to portray the unrequited love, mm. um, as opposed to the you know, not actually 
caring so much for the princess <laughs> or, or for the mermaid. Uh, so I really appreciated that. And in a way, I've, I found it a lot truer to, to the fairy tale than what most people think it is from the Disney version. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really appreciate that. And like me again, from the trailer, I wasn't expecting the little mermaid. Um, I appreciate that they did do the parallels with the, um, with him, with her reading the story. Mm. Um, from my side, I think it would have been clear enough when like, just from the introduction of Uda, when he became just called her a mermaid, like for me, that was enough that I know it would have been able to like connect to that story. Yeah. And I but picked that up it, immediately as well. Yeah. Um, but they did it well. They didn't force the symbolism, which is nice because we've seen a lot of things where they just force a symbolism and assume everyone's an idiot <laughs> watching the film. Yeah, I, I appreciated it. Man. <laughs> I want Battlecore to be a thing. I know, right? <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. Like, there's ways that you can make it at least relatively safe because they make... um like adult tag, mm. which is essentially like there's a small arena and there's a bunch of structures and you like parkour and it's tag one V one tag sort of thing. But I, I mean, I think you could make a relatively safe battle core game. Isn't is an American ninja, something like that. Uh, that's, that's more like, can you beat this thing? Mm. I don't think it's a race. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. I might have watched like an episode of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just know there was some parkour stuff in it. Well, yeah, that's again the the world building so well. I immediately like I want this. <laughs> it's just such a cool concept. <laughs> to shift focus again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would. I think I might have to take a peek back into it to see, like, what you're talking about with Makoto. Because I didn't pick up on any of that stuff. Like, I didn't see, like, a negative connotation to the headquarters or what she was doing or what she was absorbing. Um, I might have misspoke there, then. I wasn't meaning it to be a negative. Oh, okay. I was seeing it as there was a plot that could have been here. Oh, I see. It set something up, but never paid off the headquarters and such. Right, so, so yeah, sorry. that, That was more speculation because it was mentioned it was this mysterious thing. It's like, oh, well, maybe that could tie to other things. Yeah, no. That that was pure... If they made it a series, these would be cool things that could be explored. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. There was a few... There was a few times... Like, as pretty as some of the scenes were, like how they'd, like, say, show uh, Uda's eyes, or, like, how pretty they make a big look while he's passed out on the ground. But there was some like weird draw, um, jarring transitions between that. For instance, mm. when Hibiki was on the ground, like looking all pretty boy and Uta's gazing on with longing. Um, Cause he wants to, or she wants to kiss the boy. Um, <laughs> but then it like panned out to the, like a further out shot. And it was lit- like legitimately them just in three colors, no details. But the problem there was the they should have given emphasis to the background then, right? Mm-hmm. The background then should have had like a conversion of that beauty. No. Yeah. It was just kind of like average level quality for that scene. Mm. And they did that a few times that I, I thought it really jarred. Yeah, there was... Like, there were definitely scenes that were really beautiful. Um, again, good detail. You know, a f- few of the scenes were like, okay, I could kind of see this hitting that Ghibli-esque mm. style of, of... But I also didn't get the feeling of, like... I felt like there were wasted shots in this. Mm, definitely. Right? It, it's... I mean, the, the, the main guy who, who did this is definitely done films, but a lot of his work is series. These are people who worked on the Death Note series and Attack on Titan series. 
Well, that's probably why we're getting series vibes, like the director yeah. and the writers. I think all three of the writers, uh, when I looked, worked on the series to some degree. Yeah. Like, um, um, Jin Robuchi. Yes, that's how I'm going to pronounce that. Um, okay. Has definitely done movies, but there were movies based off of a series that he'd already done. Mm. So it was a continuation so, of a story or it was the next chapter. Exactly. Yeah. Release the series version. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it'd be quite good. Um, that's where it becomes a little bit discordant too, because I'm going to make, I'm going to say this with uh, um, using generalized or stereotype language. Cause it's the most convenient way to express the concept. This was marketed as targeting boys or like in a shonen aspect with the battle core stuff. Mm. Like the way that it was marketed was very much going to be like this team of misfits, like co-ed team of misfits that are doing this cool thing, having adventures. And they didn't even like, it didn't even seem to be a sport. It just like, oh, they're doing this cool thing. Yeah. And that was the advertisement I saw. But then some of the stories and aspects to it had that wouldn't quite go shoujo, but definitely more like girl orientated mm -hmm. uh, storylines within it. And it wasn't balanced in a, in a correct way. Yeah. Um, whereas if they did it in the series, they would have been able to explore those concepts and intertwine them uh, more adequately. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think like, like I said, Watching the trailer would have never expected to have um, have the the main plot that, that we did. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because like I'm pulling it up on Netflix and it's calling it a romance anime. And like this isn't in the trailer. This is where people are gonna have issues. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasant surprise again. I think that part of the story was done well but not what we were marketed and don't get me wrong. Like, um, like the, the main writer, that's something he's done. It, it's not something that he's known for that, uh, with, with other, um, things that he did that the marketing isn't necessarily going to be true. True. What, what you expect. Um, again, Bodica being a major, um, a major point of that. Well, I mean, if, and this could have been converted into something that was more romance oriented too, because mm -hmm. we, I mean, we have the Hibiki Uda stuff. That's a given that, um, mm -hmm. like you can expect the, at least one romance plot, but to market it in any form as a romance film is way left field. Um, yeah. but you could have done a, uh, something with Shin and Makoto. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was that scene when they were like talking about the kids, then you're like, is there something here? Yes. Like if they explored those concepts more. Yeah, that could have been interesting. Like again, things that would work in a series. It's like, I almost thought that they were going to have something either like have them officially there as surrogate parents mm. or have them there and have something uh mirroring Hibiki and Uta somehow. Okay. Right. Um I think I think it could have added, but yeah, yeah, we just needed a little bit more with those with these relationships. And I think that's I think really overall that's the point that we're both very much agreeing on throughout this. Uh, I mean, pick a lane. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 too much for one hour forty minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have enjoyed this film more if it was either a more on the romance side, um, like uh, adventure romance, yeah, um, or b more on the action adventure side, which is like what the tags were in IMDb. Yeah. And this definitely was an action adventure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually think like the biggest, I, I like the idea of 
splitting it into like two connected movies. Like you can have the world build up the world, but we have the the sports on the one side, and then the romance on the other. Um, I mean, I, I like the concept of that, yeah. but the downfalls is, you know, that they're going to end up like marketing it as a sequel or something. Then people are going to be mad because it's not what they expected. Um, so like, say they start out with ro- romance first. Yeah. Like all these people are going to come up being like, why are you ruining this romance thing with like this sports thing? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> well, that's why the series is optimal. Yeah. Um, because you can do this perilous because you have, and we say this a lot, but like having adequate room to breathe is really important. Honestly, as much as I like what they did with Hibiki and Uda, I'm not that keen on their characters. They're not actually that interesting to me. It was their relationship no, no. that was interesting. Yeah. I agree. Um, uh, Again, it's just that not. I think there could have been interesting character things there. Like the 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 skeleton is there. I guess that's it. Um. So these characters, none of them have a backstory. None of them have a reason for being together. We didn't have like the way that their relationships were towards each other within that group seemed very passing, except for the way that like Makoto was just concerned for everyone all the time. Mm -hmm. The only thing that made me feel like they were a united group, even in sports ball (laughs) was at the end when they all kind of suit up. No, it wasn't the suit up. It was when Kai um, comes up and he's like, you know, what the heck you doing? This was there, like, we're attached and I'm worried and I don't want you to go. And then the turnaround with Flip, which was actually a great line, was like, I'm going, are you coming? Yeah. That was probably the best line in the film, at least when it comes to the relationships beyond um, Hibiki and Uda. Hmm. Yeah, all the other characters just seem to be personality types. Which, in and of itself, isn't necessarily bad in a film. Like, you don't necessarily need to have the backstories and such around them. I think the bigger issue is, is like, and and we kind of touched on this earlier um, when we were talking about his um, superheroing. They're we're not quite getting the progression. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's almost like a bubble where it's kind of Mm. hollow on the inside, but the shell is nice. (laughs) Um, Because we have the bit, it's like, oh yeah, he's just off. I'm sure he'll show up somewhere in the first sports ball match. Mm -hmm. Right. And then uh, I think the second one he was at, like at least there at the start of it. Um, and they go and talk about it's like, okay, we'll go cause some chaos during this sports ball match. It's like, okay, but we're not seeing any of that. So we're not even seeing how the team is interacting, where they could have gotten away with some of that character development. Right? So if they had him say so start off as that loner and then actually show him, you know, causing some chaos with that other team mm-hmm. with, with against the Undertakers to show how he's, you know, being more in the fold. Um, it would have even given the payoff better at the end where he actually joined in with the team, you know, all hands in cheer. But again, we almost need more of the game to make up for that um, character. Yeah, we don't, like, we don't even know it made it feel like the team and the people living together were just out of a matter of convenience. Yes. Um, unfortunately I'm making myself like this film less than I do. <laughs> uh, it's one of these things. It's like, I guess the way to, to put it is it's fine. You could have done more, but it, 
it's not terrible. It's just fine. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's adequately fine. <laughs> yeah, it, I I would say out of the previous forty seven Battlecore matches, um. I think this film pr probably only won 27 of those sports ball bouts. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say about 30, 32. So we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're around the same, around the same page. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I, before I started talking, I was probably closer to 30, 33. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, the way I look at it, the, the things that it did well, it did really well. Again, all of the individual components were there and engaging. Not the right for format like, for the... everyone else's relationships, the characters. The... Yeah, yeah. Well, again, like some of that stuff I can let slide because, again, when you do it in a movie, you just don't have that same time. Mm -hmm. But this is where I kind of go to the, the wasted frames. Yeah. Um, because they wasted frames during the sports ball. Well, like, because they weren't showing how the team worked. They weren't showing Hibiki being more of a team player throughout that. Well, exactly. Like, those are the types of things that needed to be there. That way we wouldn't have wasted the frames. Just tighten it up that little bit if we're not making this a series. Yeah, what, what they... I mean, if the, if sports ball was going to be the progression thing, mm -hmm. um, the character introductions should have been more adequately done in the original sports ball. They had the adequate amount of time from there. Um, and then they could have explored it more in second bout versus the morticians. And... Yeah. Um, they could have shown the, the growth of the team building and then it would become paramount in the final not technically sports ball um but what they did at the end yeah which i do want to express one of the great things that i saw and this was so good even though buddy was doing backflips and moving far better than he probably would they did make an effort to show off him moving with a prosthetic limb mm -hmm. yes um <laughs> Definitely beyond, um, I mean, uh, no, I, I'll, I'll give it as a gimme because everybody was moving far beyond what they technically could have. And what I'm probably thinking of is projection because of the fantastical nature of it. Um, so I, I definitely did like, well, that's something that I guess you, you would have partially ended up missing like Shin's progression from what I was saying mm -hmm. before. Because he kept going up that tower because that's where his wife and daughter were. Um, so he lost his leg doing it. And now he watches over people. And that's why it was important because he could empathize um, to the point where he could assist Hibiki in getting to that tower because that means something to him. And that's yeah. why this, like, he's the only developed character in this entire film, Shin. <laughs> 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 Again, I, I've seen movies like, like it's sometimes it's all right for it not to be about the character and, not, and instead be about the relationship. And, and I think that's why I give it a bit of a pass because at least the main um, Hibiki Uta relationship mm. was there. Um, it loses points because it didn't show the relationship well between Hibiki and the team. Yes. And, and that. I don't really care so much about the overall character progression to mind that they're shells, but tighten up that little bit, use the sports ball to do it. Well, to kind of accentuate and uh, add to what you're expressing is at one point I felt like Uta felt more part of the team and part of the group than Hibiki. Yeah. And that was like far enough into the film where like I should have at least had some feeling like Hibiki belonged in this group. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's exactly it. It made perfect sense that Uta felt part of the group 
she was social, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? She was loving the fact that she was, that there were people around and, and getting to interact with them. I mean, she's basically been watching them for five years. <laughs> um, yeah, nope. Just tie it in. Have Hibiki and the group's relationship grow better than it did. Mm -hmm. like, uh, to pivot again, I'm all over the place, much <laughs> like this film. Um, how did they manage? So that scene after um, Bubble Uta... Jeez, oh, I want to say a bunch of random words again. That only makes sense to someone who's seen this film. This this happened in Boy and the Beast, too. After Bubble Uta saved <laughs> Child Hibiki from the bubble exploding um, Tokyo Tower, is that what it's called? Yep. Ch Child Hibiki's on the ground, and Bubble Uta is, like, hiding behind, like, a pail or, like, a fallen rock or something, right? Yeah. How did they manage to make a bubble look cute in the way that it moved? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think it's, it's, it's one of just the amazing things with animation stuff <laughs> where you can do stuff like that. Mm. The bubble had personality. Right? I, I mean, we, we've seen that in other things. It's like, here's just you know, a fish that looks like it's generic, all the other fishes, and then it turns into a girl. <laughs> and you just add the character to it. What I'm wondering is... I mean, the answer is probably it wouldn't change it that much at all. Um, but I am wondering if I would appreciate this film more if I didn't have a, such a direct comparison with Belle. Mm. Which, um, to preface, I like Boy and the Beast more, but Belle is the better film. Yeah. Um, but, like, that, that film is top-notch. So good. Um, so for this to come in as an entry, and I don't, I don't even think, like, this isn't, like... I mean, it's not names that I had heard before. Um, story and Wit. Mm. Um, one is... I think Wit is the actual production team. Mm. I think Story was the producing company. And then it was just distributed by WB and Netflix. Yes, I believe so. Um, but I couldn't find anything about the studio, so I don't know how big they are. Um, I would have laughed though. I like had this feeling for a moment though that I would look for wit, and then it end up being um, the studio that did uh, Unleash for Bandmade. <laughs> Even though the animation's not very similar, but I was just like we're talking about small studios before. Wit? No, wit. I would not call small. This is not small. I haven't heard of it before. Attack on Titan, Vinland Saga. Evangelion, uh, the movies, um, Vivi, which I think someone recommended to us ages ago. Um, okay, so it's just my ignorance. Yeah, Pokemon, Gundam. It's it's not it's not a studio like Ghibli. It, it doesn't look like it's a studio that has an identity. Mm. Like we've seen with the other studios that we've been talking about. Um, I think that might be more what it is. It's just like a uh, corporate animation studio. Yeah. Yeah. Opposed like, to like, uh, I'll yeah. call them independent animation studios, but I don't know what like the funding looks like. So it's hard mm -hmm. to like yeah. putting independent in front of the title is yeah. difficult. Um, story seems very small. Like story's got like four films listed. <laughs> but I so. think they're just, uh, I think they're just a production company. So they just, um, produce mm. opposed to being production companies that actually produce stuff. Yeah. And the, 
Yeah. I yeah. No, and none of <laughs> and like none of these are showing like a dedicated animator like we saw with yeah. with Chuzo and we saw with uh, Ghibli and, and Trigger stuff like that. So that's yeah. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll take it back. And yeah. I assumed that it was my ignorance. I thought they were small because I didn't recognize the name, and that's probably because as it's been expressed, they don't have any independent personality. They're probably more. Yeah. Um, that's all I got. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's. Stop it, Devin. That's not a comb. That's a fork. <laughs> <laughs>